many people to study uh, symmetric spaces and quadratic spaces over R. So what, what are these? So a symmetric space, space over R, over R consists of the following data. I, don't, I did want to highlight that. Symmetric space over R consists of uh, first P a projective finitely generated R module. And secondly, beta a symmetric bilinear form. Symmetric bilinear form, form on P such that it's unimodular. So in other words, the adjunct map from P to the dual of P is an iso, isomorphism it's called unimodular. Or sometimes non-degenerate, but sometimes you have to be a little bit careful between injective and surjective. So I, I, I'll refer to that as unimodular here. And then, I mean, there's the quadratic analog, a quadratic space, quadratic space, over R uh, is the same, it's the same. P is also finitely generated projective module, and then you have a quadratic form. So map P to R, a map of sets, sets such that Q of Rx is given by R squared Q of X, and the, the polarization is bilinear. So X plus Y minus QX minus QY, which we call maybe beta XY, is a uh, unimodular symmetric bilinear form. Bilinear form. Okay, that are symmetric and quadratic spaces. And you see by definition for every quadratic space I have an underlying symmetric space just given by the polarization. And so you can think of a quadratic space as a refinement of a symmetric space. And if if two is a unit in your ring, then of course you can recover the the quadratic form, the Q from the beta. And so over if, if two is a unit in your ring, I mean symmetric and quadratic spaces are the same. And as I said, that they are kind of come up a lot in number theory and they are studied to a great extent. So let me let me give you some easy examples. Examples. And so the first example is when, when R is an arbitrary finitely generated projective module, you always can associate the hyperbolic space. Hyperbolic P that is just given by the underlying module is P plus the dual of P. And this carries canonically a quadratic form, which is just given by the evaluation. And that defines the quadratic space of so the hyperbolic, hyperbolic quadratic space. Okay. So that is this. And of course, uh, as such, it then has an underlying bilinear form and we'll also refer to that as a, a hyperbolic symmetric space. Okay, that works over every ring, but sometimes you can just even classify or understand all symmetric bilinear forms. For example, over R, we have the theorem of Sylvester. And that tells us that any unimodular symmetric bilinear form or any symmetric space is just given uh, isomorphic or isometric to a copy of R with a bilinear form one, A times plus copy of the one dimensional space with a bilinear form represented by minus one to the B. And I guess the real theorem of Sylvester is that the numbers A and B are independent. These are invariants of the form. So I guess maybe you could write it as the positive part plus the negative part where the dimension of the positive and negative part are invariants. And I guess the difference is usually called the signature. Okay, that's the situation over the reals, which is basically the easiest possible situation. And then I guess you could, you could study uh, these symmetric spaces, like quadratic spaces over fields like F2 and so on. And this is, kind of, this is fun, there's a complete classification. But the case we will talk about today is the case of the integers. So over Z, over Z, it turns out that unfortunately it's very complicated. So we're basically studying integral lattices here and that is just turns out to be a super complicated topic. So in fact, I guess 
these uh, these uh, guys can be classified completely until dimension 25. So if the dimension or the rank of the underlying module is less or equal 25, they can be completely classified. But then above that, things get completely out of control. So basically, I mean, the minkowski siegel mass formula tells us that the number of these isomorphism classes of such uh, spaces grows like crazy. Like I think something like in dimension 32, we already have something like 10 to the 16 isomorphism classes of such forms. So that's just really crazy. And the thing is that um, I guess, I guess um, that there is something like a classification of unimodular forms over the integers though, but it is a classification of indefinite forms. It's a result of Hasse Minkowski. And uh, what I want to do is I want to take advantage of that. And that is usually done by introducing the Groton liquid group. I mean, one way of articulating the consequence of that is the Groton liquid group. And that's the following. So the Groton liquid group, group is defined as follows. You just take the Grotendieck with zero of symmetric R. This is just is isomorphism or isometry classes of uh, symmetric spaces, spaces over R. And then you group complete that, pretty much like in K theory, like the group K naught, right? So on symmetric spaces, there's a, a, a symmetric monoidal structure given by orthogonal sum that makes isoclasses into a monoid and then such, like in K-theory, group complete that. And that gives you an abelian group. And the same, of course, we can do with quadratic spaces. That's referred to as a quadratic Grotendieck-Witt group. So it's basically the same, just except we have quadratic spaces here. And we also group complete that. <laughs> There's a quick question from the chat. Yes. Uh, Ian asks if 25 that you mentioned before in the classification over Z is significant or just a computational limit for humans? I think somehow um, it's probably possible to do 26, but some other, I mean, we know that the numbers go out of control basically around that threshold. This is because, I mean, complications with the leech lettuce and so on come in. So Thanks. I guess there is some sort of, I mean, I'm, I'm by no means an expert on, on the exact classification, but somehow the, the fact that complications arise at the mid 20s or no later than the 30s has to do with uh, with the kind of growth that you get from the Siegel, Siegel mass formula and complications. Thanks. So I guess probably, possibly one could push it a little bit, but I'm not sure actually. I'm not by no means an expert. Maybe someone else here knows more about, about that. Okay, so good. So what did I want to say? Well, I guess then we have these groups. And now I want to articulate this theorem or like consequence of this theorem of um, Hasse Minkowski. Hasse Minkowski. And that states the following that um, turns out that this Gordon Wit group of the integers, the symmetric Gordon Wit group of the integers, is now completely, can be completely calculated. It's z plus z, isomorphic to two copies of the integers, and what is the isomorphism? You just take one of these symmetric spaces, and what you do is you take the dimension of when you really fi it, you take this positive part, right, which was this number A that I had before, which was well-defined, and you just take the dimension or the rank of V over the integers. If you want, you can also really fi and take the dimension there. And that ends up being an isomorphism. And in fact, as I said before, really they prove something somewhat stronger, namely that you can classify indefinite forms. And the trick here in order to leverage that to compute the golden liquid group is just to observe that, well, I guess you can always add forms to make it indefinite, right? Indefinite means it's neither positive nor negative definite. And then you can just make it po uh, indefinite by adding stuff, which is allowed in the golden liquid group, and then you can subtract that stuff later. And that's the way you leverage this classification. Okay, so that's the first result. And the second um, tells you that, I mean, like what the, quotin, the quadratic quadratic group is. And one way to say that is there's a short exact sequence, 
where you have the, the quadratic Grotnik width group that sits injectively in, in the symmetric Grotnik width group. And that is maybe not surprising because if you think about it, um, over the integers, admitting a quadratic refinement is just a property, right? Because, I mean, if the quadratic refinement exists, it has to be given by the bilinear form xx divided by 2. And then basically that you can use to see that this is injective. And then the statement is that the co-kernel of that is actually z mod 8. And that map is actually signature mod eight, mod eight. So basically, I mean, signature, as I said, is, is just the difference between this positive and negative part. So I guess in terms of this decomposition in Z plus Z, it takes something like twice the first guy and subtracts the second. And so it turns out then that is a crucial observation here that the signature of a quadratic form is actually divisible by eight. Okay, that's what this short effect sequence says. Okay, good. So that was basically my recap of what is known about qu classical quadratic and symmetric spaces of the over the integers. A complete classification, but I guess we're used to that from K-theory. If you can completely classify, then make your life easier, group complete, and then you can compute stuff. But of course, this is only a statement about isomorphism classes. And similar to K-theory, we might want to know something about morphisms of symmetric spaces or quadratic spaces, or said differently about some higher quadratic width groups. And to do that, uh, of course, people, Karubi and others, have introduced this uh, quadratic width spectra. That's the following definition. That is the Grotendieck width spectrum. Grotendieck width spectrum is just defined pretty much the same way that we define the K theory spectrum. Instead of taking isoclasses of symmetric spaces, we just take the category or the groupoid of symmetric spaces. And then we group complete that in the sense of higher category theory or as an E-infinity space. We make it an E-infinity group, hence a connective spectrum. So in fact, here you can use any, any, of, your, any of your preferred K-theory machines to get a connective spectrum out of a symmetric minority category. That's what we do here. And similarly, of course, we have the quadratic Grotendieck width spectrum being uh, given by, I guess, the group point of quadratic spaces group complete that guy. Okay, so this defines two spectra. And I guess, as I said, um, one can use any, any K-theory machine. And for example, one can use a version relying on the plus construction, which might be a little bit more concrete. So for example, if I want to understand Grotendieck width of the integers, I can also express that in terms of the plus construction. So maybe the underlying space of that would then be given by, I guess, Grotendieck width zero group, which we just said was C cross C cross, and then a space B O infinity infinity over the integers plus, where um, I guess B O infinity infinity is just the co-limit of groups O N N, which are just defined to be automorphisms Isometry, isometri isometric automorphisms of the following symmetric space. You just take z comma one to the n plus z comma minus one to the n. Right? These are unimodular symmetric spaces, and as such, it's going to be a subgroup of G L two n over the integers. Right? So that that tells you that I mean, what I'm what I'm talking here is really very concretely defined in terms of this arithmetic group O infinity infinity over the integers. But of course, this group is highly complicated. And similarly, you can talk about the quadratic, I mean, you can give a plus construction style definition of the quadratic Grotendieck width group of the integers. And now it turns out, I mean, our goal is to understand the homotopy groups of these Grotendieck width spectra, or like the homotopy type even better of these Grotendieck width spectra. 
But of course, once you know that it's given, you have a plus construction style description like this, you can at least attack its homology, right? But then, of course, you end up studying the homology of this, like, sort of, or the stable homology of these arithmetic groups. And that ends up being very complicated, but one can get some mileage out of that. For example, one can prove that these Gordon League width groups are finitely generated by means of that. Tomas? Yes. Quick question. There's, um, so do we know anything about this classically using homological stability? That's from Gabe, Angelina. Yeah, I guess I, I think there is some homological stability results here. Um, I think so, yes. <laughs> I think you, you have some homological stability and that way you can, can get some finite generation. But I, actually, to be honest, I'm always getting confused with this specific group. So <laughs> uh, I guess, yeah, I think, I think the answer is yes, but I'm, I don't ask me for details right now because I got confused about that beforehand and I don't want to say something wrong here on record. <laughs> okay. Sorry. You're, re you're released from your responsibility. <laughs> <laughs> I guess I'm, I'm just saying that I forgot the details. Okay, anyways. Um, so, but of course, I don't want to talk about it from the homological stability point of view, but I just want to tell you what's the homotopy type of that whole spectrum is. And that's the following theorem. Um, and that's, this, that's the following, that there is an equivalence of spectra, of spectra, so the spectrum Grotendieck width of the integers break, breaks up actually into three parts. One copy is KO plus then there's a spectrum J and there's a spectrum M. Let me bracket these together and basically uh, the map is given by sending V to, I guess it's kind of the same map as before. You somehow really phi V and take the positive part and you can make that actually a well-defined map into KO. And then this other part is basically V. So on the pi naught, this is going to contribute to Z, and this is also going to contribute to Z. And then the map is the map I had before on pi naught. And, but of course, I have to tell you what the spectra are for, to make this useful, where J is basically, I mean, basically a con connective version version of the MJ spectrum. And it's an integral version. Like somehow, which is maybe the KU local sphere. So it's, it's, it's connective and it's not quite the connective cover of the MJ spectrum. It differs from that in degree zero. This has one Z mod two less in degree zero. But anyways, it's, it's basically a connective version of the MJ spectrum. And I mean, the point is, this is completely understood. We can just read off all homotopy groups as we do classically. And again, pi naught of that guy is the integers. And um, the other some guy is a little bit more mysterious, but the homotopy groups of that are actually given by, you take the K theory of the integers. I mean, one way to articulate that is that it's the odd torsion in the K theory of the integers and two mod four, and it's zero else. And the point is that, I mean, this group, this other group, this odd torsion stuff, this is actually fairly well understood. So, I mean, this is like a finite group, group of finite order, of finite order. And the order is something like uh, the numerator of, the, of a certain Bernoulli number, B2n over 4n. And I mean, this is zero at regular primes. So it's kind of very often just zero, for example, at like sort of most primes you'll come up with randomly. And I guess it's conjecturally cyclic. Conjecturally cyclic. And this conjecture is known for I think if I looked it up correctly for star at least less than 30,000. Okay, so good. So anyways, I mean, one could say a little bit more about that in terms of Iwasawa theory or like in terms of etal cohomology, but uh, I guess I want to leave it like that unless someone has a question about that. Sorry, what do you mean by K star is the odd? So who is odd? 
I mean, odd torsion. The odd torsion in this yeah. means star, star is a degree, and then you have the K theory of Z, and then you take the odd torsion. Thanks. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, like, I mean, you, you could you could express this in terms of certain uh, second etal cohomology groups if you want. But some of the point is, then you'd have to express it one prime at a time. But this is an integral thing. Anyway, so this is basically known, except maybe the order is known, but except it's not known in all degrees. But I mean, at least for a star less or equal thirty thousand, you get a complete classification, uh, computation, and in, in all at regular primes, you get a complete uh, computation. Is there an analog for rings of integers in number fields? Yeah, I guess, I mean, I'm going to tell you in a second a little bit about rings of integers in a number field, but I guess full classification of that sort, I don't know. I mean, I guess you could somehow say something in terms of Iwasawa modules, but then I don't, I don't think somehow without any assumption, I don't think you can say much more. Like, I guess if you, if you add on like roots of unity to the integers or stuff like that, you could say more. Yeah. I mean, it's pretty much like for K of the integers, right? We know somehow something about K of the integers and when, as a homotopy type, and we know something about, I guess, I mean, for example, one consequence of this computation is that basically Grotendieck width of the integers is basically K1 local. As in saying the map from Grotendieck width of the integers to its K1 localization. And I saw actually one on. Similar to, I guess, algebraic K of the integers, there we know it's an isomorphism in all positive degrees, the map to its K1 localization. And I guess in general, you have a sort of Quillen Dichtenbaum style sort of isomorphism to this K1 localization. And that K1 localization is actually accessible in terms of Iwasawa theory. And so I guess, but this explicit with such a nice isomorphism, I don't know really a formula, which I mean, I, I can't even imagine how a formula would look like. Okay. Good, so that is uh, the first part of this result. And the second part is, I guess I wanted to say something about uh, the quadratic Grotendieck width theory of the integers. So, and then this is the analog of this statement about the signature being divisible by eight. So there is a fiber sequence. Is a fiber sequence, fiber sequence, um, which takes, Grotendieck width quadratic of the integers. Then we have this map to Grotendieck width symmetric of the integers. What is this map? This is just a map which considers a quadratic space as a symmetric space, right? So, I mean, we said before every quadratic space has an underlying symmetric space that just gives us a map of spectra. And then it turns out the cofiber of this is actually given by an einberg mclane spectrum Z mod eight plus an einberg mclane spectrum Z mod two in degree one and nothing more. So in particular, as a result, we get that Grotendieck width quadratic of the integers is isomorphic to Grotendieck width symmetric of the integers for i larger equal to. And that is actually a, a consequence of a more general theorem that we prove uh, in this nine author work, but I personally find this very, very surprising. So if you, I don't really know if we could have known that in advance, I certainly didn't. And if you think about these arithmetic groups, they are like, I mean, these are totally different arithmetic groups. Why would, why would the homotopy groups of the plus construction of those be isomorphic uh, starting from degree two on? So I don't, I mean, if someone has a good a priori argument for that, I mean, I'd be very curious. Sorry, which ones do you mean by arithmetic? I mean, I guess I mean, oh, sorry, I didn't write down the, the other one. I guess, I mean, I guess I'm saying like you could also the for, for Grotendieck with quadratic, the group that comes up is O N N, given by the automorphisms of the hyperbolic form. G L 2 N Z. That's just another complicated group sitting in, inside G L 2 N and somehow this result is telling you that the homotopy groups are isomorphic starting from degree two on of the plus construction of those. And I guess I'm just saying that I didn't see an a priori reason for that and still don't. It's just a computational fact that we get at some point. And I guess the problem is somehow it's a little hard to 
to to get an intuitive feeling for that because i mean in in, in the intuition for me always two is somehow invertible and then somehow all of that collapses anyways so that is the result and of course i should say that this is not like sort of the only theorem that has been obtained in this direction i mean first of all marco schlichting also has uh, has done a computation of Groton liquid of the integers based on results similar to the results I will talk to you that we obtained in this nine author work that he announced like one or two years ago, but I haven't seen the results yet. And I guess somehow he reduces this computation of Groton liquid of the integers, and we also do in the paper to results of Barrick Karubi. The way I will talk about it today is, is different and gives you more, namely this kind of complete homotopy type and all of that. But that is definitely true. And maybe I should say another thing what one can deduce from these results is actually once you understand the homotopy group of the spectrum completely, of course you can compute its homology. It's not so hard anymore. And then as a result, you get, you get statements about the stable homology of these groups. And that I think is also a new consequence of these results. So as far as I'm aware, this wasn't known the stable homology of these groups beforehand, I guess. If it, were, if it were, then one could have deduced the result down here, which certainly wasn't known. Okay, good. So that is uh, the statement of results that I want to give you. And now I want to tell you a little bit of how this is done. And that is my paragraph two. This is results about quotin theory. And this is basically, I mean, what I said is hashtag nine series of papers, I guess three of which have appeared already on the archive and I guess two more to come, one by all nine of us and one by Fabian and uh, Wolfgang and possibly more, but anyways, that's uh, at least. And so let me, let me tell you a little bit about uh, what is going on there. So the first thing is that if you, if you have a commutative ring, then I mean, there is a C2 action on K theory of R, and that is algebraic K theory. Here's this algebraic, algebraic K theory spectrum, spectrum of R. And let's say connective, so we don't want to get into non connective stuff today. Now that's just a connective spectrum, usual algebraic K theory, group completion of projective R modules, and then we have a C2 action. And how is the C2 action given? Well, it just sends a module to its dual. So it sends P to the dual module, P dual. And the point is, this gives you a functor from the category of R modules to itself. Actually, it's a contravariant functor, but because we pass to group hoids as a first step, it doesn't matter, right? You can just invert the morphism. So it gives you a self map of the infinity space. And then after group completion, gives you a map of spectra. And because it was a C2 action beforehand, it ends up getting, giving you a C2 action on the spectrum. Okay, that's the first thing. And the second thing is we have a whole bunch of maps connecting Grotnik with theory and algebraic K theory. So there are maps of spectra, maps of spectra. So the first thing you can do is we have this, I mean, I guess I already used this map. We have Grotnik with quadratic of R and there's a symmetrization map of Grotnik with symmetric R. That's just the thing which sends, uh, sends V comma, Q to the underlying V comma beta Q, so the polarization, right? And then there's another map, which is the hyperbolic map, which takes a projective module and associates the hyperbolic form. So it will send a V, or like, I guess, I don't know why I'm calling it V now, I wanted to call it P for projective. P, it sends P to the quadratic space P plus P dual with the evaluation form, right? That gives you a map like this. And in fact, it turns out that if you, if you look at the C2 action here, this will send P and P dual to the same guy, right? Because I mean, P plus P dual is the same as P dual plus P. So actually it turns out that this factors over the homotopy orbits for the C2 action. And similarly, we have a map here, which is just a forgetful map, which goes to K of R. It just takes a form and forgets actually that we had this, uh, I guess it takes a space and just forgets everything but the underlying projective module. 
And similar to here, because we have this isomorphism from P to its dual, we actually get that this factor through the homotopy fixed points, HC2, right? You just remember the isomorphism. And in fact, if you think about it, actually it's, it's very close to being a tautological map here, because somehow if you, if you remember your module, your projective module plus the isomorphism to its dual, which is basically what a homotopy fixed point looks like, it looks like you almost remember the whole symmetric bilinear form. Right, so this is actually looks somehow close to an ISO and actually one of the results we'll obtain in a second is that this is sometimes close to an equivalence or at least the two eddic equivalence. Okay, anyways, these are maps of spectra. Uh, I hope everyone is on board with that. These are very directly constructed. So maybe I'm gonna erase that stuff here so that I can. And now let's, let's contemplate what the composition is. So the composition from here to there what does this do? This just takes the module P and sends it actually to P plus P dual, right? This is just how, how the, identity, the maps go. And this is actually a kind of sending P plus to a P to P plus the thing where we act with the generator of C2 on. That is actually the norm, the norm map, right? The, the norm, you know, from algebra, from the orbits to the fixed points. Okay, so that is kind of, uh, the maps of spectra and the identifications we have. Um, I guess, is there a question in the chat? Ah, yes, um, there, there is. It's, it's whether um, somehow that you're viewing K theory as a Borel C2 yes, spectra. So I guess it, at this point, I'm not saying, okay, so let me maybe say something genuine. So at this point, I'm not saying anything fancy or genuine. I'm just talking like spectra with an action, nothing fancy, but um, one can use this to actually deduce uh, or construct fancy spectra. So one consequence of this diagram is actually that Grotenik Witt SR and Grotenik Witt quadratic R are the genuine C2 fixed points. I guess maybe genuine, or usually people just say C2 fixed points, but let me say that in order to distinguish it from homotopy fixed points of uh, C2 equivariant refinements or genuine, let me say genuine, of genuine C2 equivariant refinements, refinements of KR. Namely one, one C2 equivariant refinement, which we call KRS. I guess now it's a little bit unfortunate that I have R twice. And the other one, I mean, this is kind of symmetric Hermitian K theory emission K theory and KRQS, like quadratic emission K theory. And if you think about what you have to, what you have to supply in order to get such refinements where the fixed points are Grotenik Witt and Grotenik Q, then you see that you exactly have to actually provide a kind of part of that diagram. For the one part, you need this guy, this part of the diagram. And for the other one, you need, the, uh, I guess, sorry. You need this part of the diagram. <laughs> okay, sorry, I, I hope you guys know what I mean. And in particular, I mean, you also get a map, actually. That is what's the middle part, I guess, the other way around, sorry. You also get a map of C2 equivariant spectra. But I guess I don't wanna really take advantage of that equivariant uh, perspective in this talk. Okay, good. So that is uh, what I wanted to say in preparation of that. Is there a question about that? Just, just an idle one from myself. Um, are there examples where the C2 action is non-trivial on a K groups? Yes, I guess it can be non-trivial on Picard groups, right? When you send a, send a line bundle to its yeah, dual. Sure. Yeah. Okay. yeah. Like P1. Good. Yeah, I guess so. I mean, I guess this is not quite a ring, but <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Close enough. <laughs> yeah, okay. But yes, absolutely. So I guess so for the integers, as, as Ben, I guess, just observed, it, it's somehow the identity, right? Because somehow the dimension, which is the k naught of the integers, doesn't change as you take the dual, but in general, it can be, uh, can change. Okay, good. So now uh, I want to state some results that we're going to use in our computation. So, or like some, maybe the main results 
some of the main results of this uh, nine author work. And that is the following theorem, or like, I mean, I guess these are like four theorems, but I want to combine it into one. So the first is actually the homotopy limit problem. Homotopy limit problem. And that says the following, um, I guess that's the name. Um, that's the following, let R be a ring of integers, of integers, or the ring of integers in a number field, number field. Then uh, the thing I said before happens, actually, you have this map from Grotendieck Witt of R into KR HC2, and that's uh, actually the symmetric Grotendieck Witt group here, the uh, Grotendieck Witt spectrum. And the statement is that is a two adic equivalence equivalence on connective covers. Covers. Okay, that's something uh, that I said earlier. Um, so I guess um, I guess here you you somehow I mean, what I said earlier happens, and in, in census, you should think of that as some sort of um, Atiyah Siegel completion style theorem, right? It tells you that basically this genuine refinement of K of R is actually the same as the Borel style refinement after completion. So in that sense, if you like this kind of uh, equivalent homotopy theory perspective, then this is a Atiyah Siegel style completion theorem or Siegel style theorem. Sorry. I guess. Yes. Uh, so oh, how, can you repeat again, how can I think about the left-hand side about as of C2 equivalent? So this would somehow then be KR, this re emission K theory of R, and then the actual C2 fixed points. And that is somehow the homotopy fixed points. So maybe then you would write this as KR, SR homotopy fixed points. Ah, okay, now it's a That's the map from the actual fixed points to the homotopy fixed points. In that sense, it's a completion style theorem. And I mean, I should say this result was previously known if two is invertible in the ring. And this is by work of Hu, Christian Ormsby and Beric Karubi, Schlichting, Ostfair. So really, I mean, and in fact, we use their results to prove our result here. So, but some other, the main improvement is that this is going to be true at the prime two if two is not a unit in the ring, which, which happened to be the most complicated case for obvious reasons. Okay, good. So, um, and also this has been announced by Marco Schlichting as a result. And I guess it was an old conjecture of, I mean, I guess it has been discussed various times in the literature, maybe first by Thomason and then pick, taken up later in many people's work. Okay, so the second theorem, maybe this is something genuine equivalent. I just want to state it. But if you don't know this genuine homotopy theory, feel free to ignore it. It will not play a role in what's going to come later. This is what is called Karubi periodicity, which I think is a, is a really nice uh, structure theorem about these spectra. And this is really most easily stated in terms of these equivalent spectra Kr. You take the spectrum KRQR for any ring R, no assumption on the ring R, and this ends up being actually equivalent to a shift of the symmetric spectrum KRS. And actually the shift is kind of an equivariant shift. It's four minus four sigma, where sigma is a sign representation, sign representation of C2. Right, so, I mean, this is basically a sphere, but with a fancy C2 action. <laughs> so that's, I mean, you're basically smashing with the sphere spectrum, but this sphere spectrum has a C2 action, which actually on, on pi naught is the, the identity, but it's kind of non-trivial on higher homot, I mean, in, in some fancy way, non-trivial, that C2 action. It's kind of a representation sphere, as I said. And I guess somehow this result was also known if I guess I should maybe write that once known, I mean, both of one and two known if one half is in the ring beforehand. And I guess somehow beforehand, 
somehow if, if one half is in the ring, then it's really a periodicity theorem about a single spectrum, right? Because then Q and S are the same. And then you see this is just four minus four sigma periodic. But as it turns out that at the prime two, you have to distinguish. It's just not a single spectrum anymore. You have to take care of where your forms are quadratic and where your forms are symmetric. And I mean, in this form, the, the periodicity was also conjectured by Karubi and Karubi and uh, Giffen. And when I say in this form, then I mean, they have not formulated in terms of uh, equivariant homotopy theory, but of course you can sort of say something about fixed points, something somewhat concretely about fixed points here. And that's what they conjectured. Okay, so I just find it remarkable that they already sort of had, had figured out how it has to be formulated. Anyway, so third part that I will be using is something about, I mean, this isomorphism that we observed in the case of the integers between symmetric and quadratic quotinic width groups, that is actually something very general. So if R is an Ethereum, Ethereum of global dimension D, dimension D, then it turns out that the map from quotinic width quadratic R into a quotentic with symmetric R, it's an ISO for star larger equal D plus three. And I guess if, if R is two torsion free, torsion free even for star larger equal D plus one. So for the integers, you see, I mean, integers is dimension one, so you get two, and that's kind of exactly the range that I had before. Okay, so, so this is third result, and all of these results rely on the following theorem, and that is really in some sense the main theorem that we, uh, like sort of one version of the main theorem that we prove in this like series of work with the nine authors, that's that the homotopy groups, homotopy groups of the following spectrum. So what you can do is you can take the cofiber of this hyperbolic map, you take KR, homotopy orbits, and you map it into this quotentic with symmetric R. And I'm stating the symmetric version here. And I mean, if you want to say that in terms of equivalent homotopy theory, this is going to be equivalent to the geometric fixed points of this genuine spectrum. Then this, these homotopy groups are given by Ranitsky's, Ranitsky's classical short L groups. So these are like L groups as the, I mean, the, the L groups are like versions of WIT group that come up in surgery and that have been defined way before, actually starting with Wall and then by many people, like finally, I guess, Ranitsky got a, and Lurie did get also like a version for stable infinity categories. The point is, and that is actually why we can really prove all of the other results here, is that these L groups are actually much easier to understand than algebraic K-theory groups or quotient grid groups. So they have much better formal properties and they are much more computable. And that's somehow how all these results are proven. Basically, you somehow say that, I mean, if you understand algebraic K-theory and you want to understand quotient grid theory, then it's somehow enough to understand the cofiber in some sense. And sort of the point is we get a handle on the cofiber by means of that result. Okay, good. So these are the abstract results about quotentic width theory. And now let me explain how they can be used to, to compute quotentic width of the integers. The results I, I announced at the beginning, and that is for the third paragraph, computation of quotentic width of the integers at p equals two. Okay, so um, I guess the first step is that by this homotopy limit problem, by the homotopy limit problem, limit problem, we have quotentic width of the integers two completed is actually equivalent to the connective cover of the two completion of algebraic K theory of the integers and then homotopy C2. I guess I have to break it this order, right? So homotopy fixed points are not quite connective, of course, but you take the connective cover. 
that is the homotopy limit problem and that's what I want to input. And if I have time in the end, actually, I can even tell you how to prove this for the integers. You don't even have to use, I guess I said, our proof of this homotopy limit problem relies on all earlier motivic work by Hu, Grish, Ormsby and Barry Karubi, Schlichting, Oestwehr. But in this case of the integers, one can actually in fact prove that very directly based on an L-theory computation. I, if I have time in the end, I explain how. So it doesn't really rely on any, anything but this L-theory comparison that I called for beforehand. Okay, so that is the first thing. So in other words, we have to compute these homotopy fixed points of K of the integers. And now we use a nice description of K of the integers at the prime two. And that is actually, I think, was first conjectured or brought up as a model by Bergstedt and then by Dwyer Friedlander. Friedlander, uh, I mean, when they formulated the Quillen Lichtenbaum conjecture at the prime two, and then I guess proven by Wojewodski. Well, I guess it's a consequence of the results of Wojewodski. And it says that there is a fiber sequence. Fiber sequence. If you want to understand k theory of the integers at the prime two, then there's a map to ko at the prime two, completed at two, I guess just a reification. And then actually there's a map to tau larger equal four ku completed at two, the complex k theory. And the, this map is complexification followed by psi three minus one. Where C is the map, the complexification map from real K theory to complex K theory. And psi three is the Adams operation. So psi three minus one is a map from KO to completed to, I guess, a priori it would end up in KO to completed, but it turns out very easily that it factors through the four connective cover of KO to completed. That is because I guess the Adams operation sends one to one and eta to it eta to eta. And that's why you see it factors through the four connective cover. Well, it's said differently, the chunk that comes out of the sphere has to be fixed by the Adams operation. Okay, so there's this fiber sequence. And in fact, uh, this fiber sequence is constructed in a somewhat geometric way. So all the maps come from maps of rings, if you say it correctly. And then, I mean, as a result, we get the following addendum to that theorem. If you, if you look carefully enough into the construction of this fiber sequence, you get the addendum that this is actually is a C2 equivalent fiber sequence. Fiber sequence. I guess, and I, I, I should say naive Borel C2 equivalent. For the following C2 actions, I guess the C2 action on K of the integer that we care about, and how does C2 act on KU for, I mean, the C2 action for the conjugation action action on KU. So in other words, the action by the Adams operation Psi minus one and the trivial action, trivial action on KO. And again, this is Psi minus one. And the way you see that is basically because all of these actions just come from sending a vector space to its dual. You just work out what that action does on the K theory spectrum and on the KO spectrum and it ends up being what I just said. For example, you see that it has to be the Adams operation because it does exactly that on line bundles. Okay, good, so that is the action. So as a result from this fiber sequence, which is C2 equivalent, we get an induced fiber sequence after taking homotopy fixed points. So we get, we get the two completion homotopy C2, then we have KO, two completed homotopy C2, and then we have this tau larger equal four KU homotopy C2. Okay, so we get such a fiber sequence and then we can just take connective cover, to connective cover of that. And then we just get, I guess, if we take the connective cover of that, we just get grotenik witt theory of the integers as we just said before. And then we have a map to the homotopy fixed points of that and the connective cover, but that is known. I mean, these are just the mapping spectrum from RP infinity to KO. And that is known by means of Atiyah Siegel completion, right? So, or I guess Siegel completion in this case. So this is just KO2, two copies of KO2. Just a refinement of the representation ring by the two possible representations that come up. And then here actually it turns out that by a little computation with the homotopy fixed point spectral sequence, this guy is tau larger equal to KO. 
to complete it and you can work out what this map is. This is psi three minus one followed by the addition map. So what's the addition map? The addition map is just the map from KO plus KO to KO, which just adds, comes from the direct sum on vector spaces. Okay, and now from this, you immediately get the result. You get that Grotenlieg width of the integers at the prime two, and I should have actually, everything here was too complete in case I forgot to write to completion somewhere. Grotenlieg width of the integer is completed at the prime two is just one copy of KO because this addition map actually uh, has a section plus, and then you get the fiber of the other map plus the fiber of psi three minus one from KO to tau larger equal two KO. And that is actually the two completion of the result that I had before. This is like the J spectrum at the prime two. The J spectrum I had introduced earlier. And, and note, this is, as I said, like if you, if you took somehow KO here in the fiber, then you would get something like the, the MJ spectrum, or maybe, I mean, Mahovald has a version where you put tau larger equal four here. So these things differ in degree zero by, by Z2 and maybe degree one. But anyways, that's the spectrum that we get. And this is how this result is proven at the prime two. And then somehow part of the, part of the point to get it integrally is to, to also compute it after inverting two. But that was actually basically known already. I guess it hasn't really been stated in that way, but somehow it, it was basically known what the homotopy type is. And then you just have to find a uniform description over all primes. And that I just gave you before, where we have these maps that exist. And let me end this computation by a little remark. Remark. And that is what I said. Toby fixed point. When you see the only thing I've actually used basically here is that this equivalence here, right? I've not used anything but that. And then from that on, I've, I've just computed these homotopy fixed points of KZ. And I guess at least for the two primary computation and uh, a similar computation similar computation with this fiber sequence, this fiber sequence gives that if you take K D of the K of the integers and you take the Tate construction, then you can compute the homotopy groups of that. And this has actually very surprisingly and beautifully simple description. It's just gonna be the two addicts and all degrees zero mod four and it's gonna be Z mod two for star equals one mod four and zero else. And I think this is actually quite remarkable if you, if you think about how complicated K of the integers is, that the Tate spectrum becomes this easy. And then, I mean, this ends up being actually equivalent to, and now I'm gonna say it, it's a two completion of the symmetric A theory of the integers. And in fact, actually, you can also figure out what the ring structure is. It's just going to be given polynomial on a generator in degree four, and then you have an exterior guy in degree one. And actually, once you know that, and this, as I said, it's just a computation basically with the Tate spectral sequence importing differentials from this homotopy spectral, homotopy fixed point spectral sequence here. And once you know that, you can actually deduce this homotopy limit problem for K theory of the integers. Namely, we look at the, the Tate square. Tate square for um, KR, this equivalent spectrum Z. And that is just gonna look, take the following form. You take the symmetric quantum width theory of the integers. Here you have LSZ. And then you have KZ HC2. And here you have KZ Tate C2. And maybe I should have said, this is maybe the, the key thing. I mean, a priori, you have the geometric fixed points here, right? Or like you have coordinate grid of the integers, modulo, the, or the cofiber of the hyperbolic map. Cofiber of hype. You have a pullback square like this. And this completely, I mean, this is, this is nothing at all. I've not used anything like this, just because uh, by definition, the fiber here is called in the K theory of Z HC2. Right, which is also same as the fiber here. And so then the point is, I, I told you that somehow our main result number four, the theorem told us something about the homotopy groups here. And the point is this ends up also being 
isomorphics of the homotopy, or actually the spectrum is also equivalent to the connective cover of this A theory Z tool. And then just by, you see that this map is actually a two completion map. And once you know this map is a two completion, so this is then a two adic equivalence, two adic equivalence, hence also the map from Grodnik Witt of the integers to KZ HC2. It's being a pullback. So just from being able to calculate this K theory of the integers Tate C2 and from knowing this one identification, which I said is basically the main result of our whole series of papers, you can immediately calculate Grotnik width of the integers. Uh, sorry, you don't want the two completion on the top right corner, right? Yes, I guess you're right. So I guess I'm beforehand I was forgetting two completions. So I guess you're right. So the point is that um, the spectrum down here is actually automatically too complete as every Tate C2 spectrum. So this map is in fact a two completion. Particular, and I should say a two adic equivalence after connective cover. Connective cover. Okay, good. So I guess that is the last thing I wanted to say. So let me just summarize again that the computation of Grotenleague width of the integers is basically an immediate consequence of that part four for the integers. That you can just identify the cofiber of this hyperbolic map, or at least the homotopy groups of the cofiber of this hyperbolic group with these classical L groups of the integers. And they can be completely calculated. Okay, good. Then I thank you very much and end my talk here. <laughs> Okay, well, let's uh, thank Tomas for a wonderful talk. And are there any questions? So I have a question about the K1 localizations that you mentioned earlier. Yeah. Um, so, sorry, so I guess, uh, so this is in particular Saying that if you if you K one localize uh, this uh, GW spectrum for um, for the integers, it's uh, it's Borel equivariant. And so it, is that true for any uh, any ring? Oh, you mean at the prime two? Uh, yeah, at the prime two. I mean, no. I mean, so I guess I guess. Uh, I mean, I guess, no. I mean, so, so the, the point is that, um, yeah, so I mean, I guess basically you're asking if this homotopy limit problem holds true for every, for every ring of integers. Sorry, uh, K1 local. And I think the answer is no. So I think what happens is that, um, I mean, it's a little hard to say because um, I mean, I don't, I don't even fully understand how you. So maybe Akil, I'm a little bit confused about the way you phrased that. Because I mean, K1 locally, these Tate spectra are zero. Right. Uh, yeah, but sorry. Uh, I guess I mean that. So if you take the K1 localization of the GW spectrum. Is that going to be so at the time two? Is that there's always going to be the C two homotopy fixed points of the K one local K theory? I don't think so. I mean, at at prime two, yes, right. Sorry, Isn't the K one localization of the L theory spectrum of the integer zero? By yeah, theory. so I think that would imply it. Yes. So, and everything is a is a module over it. So. Yes. Okay. So at prime two, yes, at odd primes, no. No, wait, I mean, wait, sorry, I don't, I mean, I fully, st still didn't fully get the question. Maybe I, I'm confused. What is the exact question? Like, you take Grotendieck, yeah. sorry, you take Grotendieck width of any ring, K1 localize it, and what? And so, right, so that maps to the C2 homotopy fixed points of the K1 local K theory of R. Yes. And so the question was, is that always an equivalence? Okay, and some of my co-authors said yes. 
right, sorry. Yeah. What's the argument again? <laughs> I mean, at prime two, the I mean, because of this fact that fixed points and orbits, K1 locally agree, it's just the question whether or not K1 localized L theory vanishes. But at prime two, that's Einberg McLean. So okay. it does vanish K1 locally. Okay. I guess, yeah. So I guess somehow, yeah. Okay, so yes. Yes, because <laughs> K, I mean, I guess KZ takes C2, the K1 localization is zero. I mean, this is actually maybe a very surprising fact. KZ takes C2 is actually, in fact, is a is an HC module. Yeah. I mean, it's actually even a little bit more than that. But yeah. So I'm confused about the parentheses. Should the K1 localization be on the outside? Top right, or, or what is the order of K one? Yeah, I'm confused about the order you're taking with it. Uh, sorry, what? Should oh, yeah. the K one localization be after homotopy C two fixed points, or am I just confused about what this map is? I guess uh, yeah. I guess you could. I mean. It's a different thing, right? So I guess, but the Tate vanishes. So I guess, yeah. I, I, guess. I don't see how to say anything about the statement you had there without if the Tate vanishes. Right. But, yeah. um, but and also, doesn't the Tate vanish just because of like this ambidexterity result? Like I don't. I guess I don't see how that is related to. No, but how how, how would you know that? I mean, the Tate spectrum vanishes here. For every, I mean, I mean, you just take K there of a ring. Of commutative ring and, and take C two on 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 that. Why would that vanish? I mean, I guess you could you could somehow try to attack that question by observing that KFC integers is almost K one local or something. But I guess somehow this also goes somehow into into. I mean, yeah, we can we can be more specific about that. Yeah, sorry. Yeah, now I see that. Right, remember MXA would yeah. would be with. Equation on the inside, and this would be on the outside. So, yeah, I see my confusion. Okay, thanks. Any any other questions for Tomas? I I had one, but I I think you answered it. Um, uh, so I, I was curious. The homotopy groups of the key theory of Z Tate C two looked tantalizingly like those of K O, but there's not somehow a direct connection because you're saying that it's actually Eilenberg McLean. Right. Okay. I mean, it is funny. It is funny. There's a spectrum. <laughs> there is somehow this spectrum interpolating your question. Uh huh. I mean, <laughs> this is funny. I mean, there's this funny spectrum called, I guess, let, let's take L theory of the reals, <laughs> symmetric L theory of R. of the reals. And it turns out that this has the following property. If you take, if you invert two, then this is actually a KO, I guess. And with, if you, two inverted. Hmm? with two inverted. Yeah, but or maybe, maybe, maybe let me look at, sorry. I mean, I guess I want to say LS of the integers, sorry. Metric idea of the integers, sorry. And I guess this is, F, F, if you invert to it's, it's this guy. And if you complete it to, then it's actually gonna be given by this, I mean, as we just, sorry, as we just said, this is given by, and I should take the integers. Then this yeah. is given actually by uh, KZ, KZ2. <laughs> so this somehow interpolates your question, right? Yeah. Give you a connection, but of course, it, I mean, there can't be a direct connection because, as I, as I said, this is generalized Einberg McLean, and this is, of course, K theory. But it's kind of a funny, I mean, it's kind of a funny spectrum. In some sense, it has some sort of formal group law, which, which roughly looks like x plus y plus 2xy. And it's, it's a fun little exercise to take this formal group law, and if you're Invert to this is of course a multiplicative formal group law, but if you if you complete it to it turns out that this is actually the additive form group law by checking that some sort of denominators in the logarithm work out. There's enough tools around to, to make everything cancel out and this be integral. Anyway, so uh, this is yeah. Great. Any other questions? 
Well, let's thank Tomas again, and probably some people will stick around for a couple more. Thank you. Beautiful stuff. I'll stop recording unless there are more questions. No? And stop sharing. Yes. I have